I told you Smash Brothers players to get off of my lawn! You kids have it so good these days when it comes to free-to-play games. You got your League of Legends and your Fortnites and your... and your Dotas. Back when I was your age, all we had was Soul Dat and we loved it! Now don't get me wrong, I love me some Fortnite flossing like you wouldn't believe. But gosh darn it, whenever I hear the words Battle Pass, I just want to take out my dentures and throw them across the robe. Grandpa, are you doing the thing about free-to-play games again? Yes! <sighs> okay, do you just want me to tell the story this time? Okay, Sonny. Uh, uh, can we play Super Turbo after this? Yes, we can play Super Turbo, Grandpa. After this video, okay? In the mid-2000s, if I was playing video games on my PC, chances are I was on Iggy.com. If you're not familiar with Iggy or you're just unfortunate to be too young to experience it in its heyday, Iggy was basically a game launcher that hosted free-to-play games developed in South Korea. Games like Gunbound and Soldier Front, and most famously, Guns the Duel. I got arthritis in my right hand because I tried to learn case styling! These games, along with stuff like Soldad and Rasterworks, were some of my earliest experiences with competitive online gaming. But in 2007, Iggy released a game that was a little different than their current offerings. A free-to-play fighting game by the name of Quan Ho, the Fist of Heroes. Mm. At its most basic, Quan Ho was a Virtua Fighter knockoff, a 3D three-button fighter with a focus on attack strings and real-life martial arts disciplines. Quan Ho was not great. It was pretty clunky, the game ate a lot of inputs, the net play at the time was god-awful, and they had some pretty devious free-to-play monetization hooks, or at least it would've if it would've lasted for more than six whole months on the service. But you know what? It was a free-to-play traditional fighting game on PC. And that's something that this many years later, I could be in the mood for again. So that's why I found this announcement during EVO 2019 interesting. Uh, I want to be able to let people in on maybe like the worst kept secret in the universe, which is uh, I can confirm that we are working on a fighting game for Riot. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. The more I thought about this announcement and the more that I read online discussion and the fighting game community leaders talking about it, the more that I realized that Riot has a once in a generation opportunity on their hands. Not only the opportunity to make a great new fighting game, but also the chance to change fighting games as we know them and usher in a new golden age the likes of which haven't been seen since the era of Street Fighter 4. Let me explain why. But before I do, please follow me on Twitter, subscribe to me on YouTube, and support me on Patreon. Now let's talk about it. Figuring out why Riot exactly would want to make a fighting game requires a little context. As such, we need to talk about two twin brothers from California, Tom and Tony Cannon. Coming this summer, two brothers in a van, and then a meteor hit, and they ran. They're some of the longest tenured and most respected figures in the fighting game scene. I'm talking Mount Rushmore levels of respected here. They helped establish Battle by the Bay, which would eventually become EVO. They helped establish Shoryuken.com, which in its prime was an absolutely invaluable resource to grow the fighting game community at a time that it needed it most. And one day in 2006, whenever Tony Cannon was fed up with the lack of acceptable online play in fighting games, he sat down on his computer and created GGPO. If you've ever complained about playing a fighting game underwater, you're more than likely referring to a peer-to-peer -peer network, slowing down your entire game to compensate for lag. GGPO was a brand new type of netcode that would predict a player's movements ahead of time and roll back the game state if those predictions didn't come true. 
That eventually led to much faster and better feeling online play. We get the packet on the internet and we're like, crap. Three frames ago, that guy hit the punch button. I need to go back in time, enter the punch, and then figure out where we should be. And it'll look like this, right? That's that cocked frame from a while back. So the active frame and the starting, you don't see those. You just go right from idle to cocked. But let's get back to the brothers because they are they have a strong bond. You don't want to know about it here, but I'll tell you- So with decades of experience using their incredibly deep understanding of fighting games to grow communities, crafting new tools to drive their favorite games forward, Tom and Tony looked at each other and said, why don't we just make our own fighting game? So they snapped up close personal friend, FGC icon, and designer on games like Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Seth Killian, and created Radiant Entertainment. Their debut fighting game would not only use the lessons they learned from a lifetime of fighting game design, but would also make major concessions to those who may find fighting games a little too intimidating or hard to play. To that end, the trio began work on what would eventually become Rising Thunder. A free alpha for Rising Thunder was released in July of 2015 and stuck to the mission of making a deep but accessible fighter. The game had three buttons for normal moves and three special move buttons. Functions like supers and throws also had single input commands. Their dedication to simplicity was so apparent that they didn't let you execute throws with a combination of buttons because that would open the door for advanced techniques like option selects to sneak in the game. Despite that, there was a dash cancel system, super tough links, great online play thanks to GGPO3, and special move variations that opened up new ways for characters to control, which helped widen the skill floor and the skill ceiling. The result was a game that, despite its simplicity on the surface, was still fundamentally solid. Simple enough for a casual player, but if you were willing to stick it out a little bit, you could actually pull off some really impressive looking stuff. It was a lot of fun, and actually had the support of some of the top fighting game pros at the time. But unfortunately, Rising Thunder wasn't long for this world, as it, much like Quan Ho, was shut down less than a year after the launch of its first alpha. But unlike Quan Ho, Rising Thunder, or at least the team that made Rising Thunder, caught the eye of a much bigger fish in the world of video games. Riot Games struck it rich with League of Legends. They were at the right place, at the right time, with the right product. Thanks in part to its accessible gameplay and free-to-play business model, along with winning the Twitch.tv lottery, League became a worldwide phenomenon. But all that success came at a cost. Riot had gotten so big from League that the company had grown and grown, but could only dedicate resources to their cash cow. They couldn't afford to add that S to Riot Games until their next big project was just about guaranteed to be great. So when a crew like Radiant comes through with an idea to create a fighting game on PC, with the intention of simplifying an impenetrable genre for casual gamers with a cosmetics-based monetization model, I think Riot saw a little bit of themselves in this small team. So in March of 2016, development of Rising Thunder was halted, as Riot brought Radiant into the fold and put them to work on Riot's very own fighting game. This acquisition was huge for Radiant. Before they were bought out, Radiant only had $4.5 million in seed funding and $750,000 from their Stonehearth Kickstarter. That sounds like a lot of money, but between paying employees, infrastructure costs, and the cost of doing business in California, that money can start stretching really quickly when all you have is a voxel-based city builder and alpha for a free-to-play fighting game. With Riot's financial backing, the Brothers Cannon can actually afford to stop putting together pitches for funding and instead take their time, hire the most capable developers, world-class artists, and draw from Riot's already mind-blowingly deep pool of talent to make the best game they possibly can. So now with all of that context out of the way, let me tell you why this could cause a huge shakeup in the fighting game market. First and probably most importantly is the already established fan base that Riot Games has. Riot is a god amongst men in the gaming world. In 2017, League of Legends topped 100 million players. People know the world of League. Riot's fighting game can be an entirely new IP with new characters and a new universe separate from its most favorite game, and people would still play it, yeah. 
But if this is the next step for the world of Runeterra, millions will sight unseen, make the jump over, and at least give it a shot. That means millions of new faces in the fighting game scene, and thousands of brand new fighting game content creators. Imagine how great it would be for the FGC to have 10 more Maximilians, a few more Tasty Steves, hell, even a few more Stumblebees. League of Legends has grown exponentially ever since its launch in 2009, and as is true for any good game on the rise with competitive value, the best wanted to play against the best. Riot recognized this as a great marketing opportunity for the game and their community, and established League of Legends esports leagues around the world, in North America, to China, Brazil, Europe, Japan, Turkey, Korea, and beyond. League of Legends esports has become a beast in and of itself, constantly pulling in millions of eyeballs for each match they put on. This focus on the competitive side has meant the development of in-game tournament tools, a robust ranked match feature set for League of Legends, and hundreds of millions of dollars in esports prize pools for the top teams around the world. I'm not asking for the esportsification of the fighting game community, but if Riot dedicates even a small fraction of those resources towards this fighting game project, we could be looking at one of the only fighting games around with useful stat tracking, innovative quality of life features, online tournaments, and the biggest prize pools that we've ever seen for a fighting game. But arguably, the toughest battle that a new fighting game faces is simply getting people in the door. The entire point of Rising Thunder's free-to-play status was to get a large and active fan base fairly quickly. But getting players in is one thing. You know how you keep them around? By giving them a game with great gameplay and even better netcode. And with the wealth of talent and technology that the Cannon Brothers are able to put around them, I'm sure whatever game we get will at least be something to tell our friends about. Now let's jump ahead into the future. Let's assume that Riot's Fighter releases to critical acclaim, its simplified control scheme but surprisingly deep mechanics bring in millions of fighting game junkies and league players alike. The game's free-to-play strategy works, causing the player base to balloon out of control. The esports scene is surprisingly strong, and they're making a killing off of sales of costumes and other cosmetics. What then do the other AAA developers do while Riot is making money hand over fist from the fighting game community? I'll give you a hint. They're gonna make their own high-budget fighting games. Just like DayZ spawning countless Battle Royal games, Overwatch exposing the craving for hero shooters, and every licensed property seeming to want a piece of that Hearthstone pie, whenever a game is able to resonate and become the next big thing, copycats aren't that far behind. And that's not a bad thing at all. New games mean new mechanics, new characters, and fresh takes on what a game could be. There's a world of difference between games like PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, Fortnite, and Apex Legends, and there will be just as much, if not more, variation in fighting games released by heavy hitters like Riot, Blizzard, and EA. Now, don't get me wrong, Riot's fighting game will definitely have to solve plenty of problems inherent to the fighting game genre in order to really break back into the mainstream, like catching new players up to speed, or how to make players accept personal responsibility for losses when they don't have a team to fall back on, or quality matchmaking for every skill level. If they can solve those problems, and that's a huge if, it could be the flashpoint where I think fighting games could end up more popular than ever before. We could see a Warcraft fighting game, or an Overwatch brawler. Epic could get on the action and create the Fortnite of fighting games. Hell, Seth Killian's working for him now, who knows what's gonna happen. As a community, we would see a boom in content creation as more and more people look to get into fighting games by watching the best personalities that the FGC has to offer. Not to mention that, in all likelihood, we would see the usual suspects of Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Smash, Blaze Blue, and others increase their investment into their existing franchises due to the boost in audience that Riot's fighting game could bring about. I do realize what I'm saying has a pretty low percentage chance of actually happening. Like I was saying, fighting games as a whole have a lot of factors working against them. It's gonna take some fresh new thinking, and a small miracle to really get back to Street Fighter 2 levels in a post-Fortnite world, 
But God damn it, if Riot is able to roll the dice and it lands on nat 20, I reserve the right to say I told you so. And if there's any company that can break into the fighting game market with a desperate need for quality games, I think that Tom, Tony, and their team at Riot Games are the ones to make it happen. You youngins these days don't know the pain of having to wait 45 minutes for one mush mom to show up, and you might not even be the one to kill it! You kids don't know the pain of having to bury 10,000 bones to bring your prayer level up one in RuneScape. That's a level of grind that nobody does these days. Oh, sure, you have your Twitter, your Facebook now, but when I wanted to learn fighting games back in the day, we had to go on forums. Do you know what those are, kids? I thought not. <laughs> oh, my God.